the Doubles Only Tennis Podcast, where you learn the best tips and strategies in the world to help you become a smarter, more effective tennis player. You'll hear interviews with pro tour doubles players and coaches, including easy to use lessons to improve your game and win more matches. My name is Will Bocek, founder of the Tennis Tribe, doubles strategy coach and host of the show. Welcome to the Doubles Only Tennis Podcast. My name is Will. I am the host of the show. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about how to create a game plan and how to make in-match adjustments on the doubles court. So this is going to be a really good strategy episode if you are a league or tournament doubles player and you get down in a match and you're just not sure how to adjust, but you know something needs to change. Or if, like me, you play tournaments around your uh, your local area or leagues around your local area, and you play a lot of the same people, and you know you know you have a particular team tomorrow, how can you work with your doubles partner, create a game plan to put yourself in a winning position to beat that team? So the first thing we have to talk about is matchups. Anytime we're creating a game plan, creating a strategy. Essentially, what we're trying to do is create a matchup that is uh, where the odds are in our favor or where we have the advantage. So there's a lot of different layers to this, and I'm going to walk you through a framework here in a second that I've kind of developed over the years and that I like to use on the court to uh, create a strategy and create a game plan to beat a specific team. But I wanted to start with an example. So over the last year, I've played a little bit more singles, and I have played a lot of matches against this one particular opponent. Uh, and when I play this player, we're, we're roughly pretty even. Uh, sometimes he wins a set, sometimes I win a set, uh, or the match. Uh, a lot of times it'll go to tiebreakers. So if you look at the matchup, it's probably about a 50-50 battle. But there's different layers to the matchup, right? So we want to think about uh, more than just, you know, I'm better than the opponent, or in this case, the opponent and I are about evenly matched. Uh, When we get into points with this particular player, when I get into points with them, when I get into a forehand-to-forehand cross-court rally, I like the odds in my favor. When we get into a backhand-to-backhand rally, the odds flip and go to his favor. So he's got a slightly better backhand than my backhand. I've got a slightly better forehand than his forehand. So what I want to be doing is playing more points with my forehand, even if it means to his forehand. Ideally, we would go my forehand to his backhand, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, but the, probably the strongest shot on the court would be my forehand, and the weakest shot on the court in this case is my backhand. So I want to be hitting forehands and avoiding my backhand at all costs. And I, the, sometimes the best way to do that is for me to hit to his forehand Uh, even though it's stronger than his backhand, because my forehand is better and he will have trouble taking that forehand down the line to my backhand. That was probably hard to follow. So I'm going to walk you through this framework and make it a little simpler for you. But the point of that story is we want to be thinking about matchups on a deeper level than just I'm better than that player. We want to be thinking about your forehand versus their forehand, your backhand versus their backhand, uh, volleys, serves, returns, and so on. So I want to start with the framework here. Uh, There's six levels to this, uh, plus kind of a bonus seventh. Uh, And I'm correlating each level to make this simpler for you with a USTA rating. Uh, This isn't an exact science. This is, you know, there's a lot of gray area here. But this framework will help us think about this kind of in the right way. So we're going to start with the bottom, which is level one. Uh, I'm calling it the USTA 2.0 level, which I think is the very bottom level. I'm not even positive about that. But anyways, we're, we're talking about level one. So level one uh, at this USTA 2.0 complete beginner level, it's all about the matchup of one team versus another. One doubles team versus another doubles team. Whichever team is better is probably going to win the match. Now, that's that's always the case, but as we get into higher and higher levels, you'll see that there's a lot more to it than just which team is better, uh, especially for creating 
our game plan and adjusting our strategy and match. But on level one, it's a team versus a team. So when we move up to level two, uh, this is, I'll call it the USTA 2.5 level. So you, you've played a little bit of tennis, but you're still uh, working on your skills and working on your technique. So on this level, we're looking at player versus player matchup. So at the 2.5 level, you start to get the ability to kind of redirect the ball a little bit. You're not just trying to uh, hit it back into the court and wherever it goes, that's where it ends up. So when I say uh, we're, we're at a kind of player versus player level, what I mean by that is players at level two or this USTA 2.5 level can direct the ball at the weaker player on the other side of the net. So rather than a team versus team matchup, we can look at a player versus player matchup. Now, if the strongest player on the other side of the net, or I'm sorry, if the strongest player is on the other side of the net, but the weakest player is also on the other side of the net, at this level, we can just attack that weakest player. And that can be our strategy. A very basic strategy, but if you're at the 2.5 level, you're not going to be able to do a whole lot more than just try to direct it at that player. So what we're doing is we're setting up matchups to where my partner and I are matching ourselves up against the weakest player on the other side of the net. And we think that the odds to win the match are going to be in our favor if we set up that, uh, that matchup, if we continue to play against that weaker player and keep the ball from the stronger player. All right, so that's level two. Level three is our USTA 3.0 level that worked out. And for this level, we've got a little bit more skill set, a little bit more direction. So rather than just attacking a weaker player, at this point, we can direct the ball even better and we can attack a specific shot by the weaker player. So that may be a forehand or a backhand. So now instead of just picking two one of two options we have four options we can hit it to player a's forehand player a's backhand player b's forehand player b's backhand so what we need to be thinking about at this level is which of those four shots is weakest how can we set up our own strengths against that weakest shot and where's the ball likely to come back if we do hit it at that weakest shot right so in the singles matchup that i talked about uh, a little bit earlier, when I hit my forehand down the line to the opponent's backhand, that's my favorite matchup. But the ball is more likely to come back to my backhand, which I don't like. I don't want to be hitting backhands. So I might be better off going cross court to their forehand and make them come back cross court to my forehand because that matchup I do like. So we want to be thinking about all these things. Uh, again, level three, we're targeting a, a forehand or a backhand. Probably it's typically the backhand of the weaker player on the court or the weakest player on the other side of the net. But um, but do the best you can to kind of work with your partner, figure out which one of those shots, uh, which one of those four shots is the weakest. So level four is when we start to get into a little bit more advanced strategy. So it's easy at this point to pick out that player's weaker on the other side of the net or that player's backhand is really bad. They slice down on it and it floats up and we can hit a volley or whatever it may be. But at level four, and this is, you know, I, I'm ballparking here, but around this USTA 3.5 level, players I notice start to be able to direct the ball well, but they also are able to put different depth and heights on their shots. So with that, we have a totally, or we have two totally new variables to kind of experiment with and figure out where the weakness is on the other side of the net. So if the player is a player who serves and stay back, stays back, which most players are at this 3-5 level, we might, may find that the player struggles with high forehands or with low short backhands or something like that. So we can experiment with not only the four options of player A forehand, player A backhand, player B forehand, player B backhand, but we can also experiment with player A 
short forehand, player A, uh, deep backhand with a lot of height, things like that. So again, this is another variable to, to kind of layer on top of our strategy. Uh, and we can figure out, we're kind of playing with all of these to figure out, okay, what's the biggest weakness on the other side of the court and how, we can, how can we make sure that we match up our strength against that weakness and force a lot of errors and, and set ourselves up uh, at the net on the doubles court. So that's level four. Level five, uh, we're getting into pace. So this is the USTA 4.0 level. Uh, this is around the level where I see a lot of players able to kind of vary their paces a little bit more. Uh, some of them are able to get into level six as well, which is spin, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But pace is a big one. Uh, a lot of players, especially at the 4.0 plus level, might like pace. We talked about on the last episode with uh, the uh, how to beat a lobber or how to beat a team that pushes. A lot of those lobbers or pushers love to play against people who hit with pace so they can use that pace and hit deep lobs uh, back across the uh, over the net player's head. So we want to be playing with pace and experimenting with pace to see what the other team is uncomfortable with. A lot of players are going to struggle with a lot of pace, but as we hit with more pace, the odds of us making the ball go way down. So we want to factor that into account or take that into account. Uh, and a lot of players um, really enjoy pace. And if you hit a slower ball that's high and deep in the court, maybe they'll struggle a little bit more or a, a shorter ball that's low. Uh, without a lot of pace, that they don't know how to generate their own pace. So uh, pace is the fifth variable here that we're going to be kind of playing with. And the sixth one is spin. So with spin, we're looking at the roughly USTA 4.5 level. Around this level, most players are pretty comfortable hitting different spins on their shot. Uh, and of course, all this applies to the serve and return as well. But um, when we're talking about spin, uh, we're talking about either top spin, uh, sometimes you can hit a flatter ball, or a slice or underspin or backspin, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that's the last variable we want to experiment with. A lot of players uh, will enjoy hitting against top spin because they practice against a ball machine all the time. A lot of players enjoy hitting against the flat ball because they hit on a wall all the time. Uh, some players might not have any trouble with backspin because they grew up playing with a player who hit a lot of backspin or something like that, you know. Um, we want to just experiment with that and figure out what makes the team on the other side of the net uncomfortable. And then the last kind of bonus variable for us is positioning. So this is when we're talking about uh, serving formations. If you didn't listen to the episode on serve team strategy, uh, I definitely recommend that. Go back and listen to that. Uh, but we might find that positioning ourselves in the I formation uh, forces a lot of errors or uh, serving and volleying forces a lot of air return errors because it puts pressure on the opponent. Or maybe playing two back uh, forces a lot of errors because the uh, other team at the net is trying to hit angles that they just can't make. And uh, while we're two back, we're able to lob them, whatever it may be. Uh, positioning is a huge, uh, a huge factor when we're talking about uh, creating a strategy. So, um, using our positioning to either put pressure on the opponent or force them to hit in a certain direction that they're uncomfortable with is a great way to game plan and to make adjustments during a match. So, what I want to do next is go over a few examples with you of different matches I've played in and how I've kind of used some of these uh, some of these different levels of strategy to uh, help you il or to help illustrate for you uh, how this works in a real scenario. So the first example I wanted to go over is a match I actually just played uh, about a week ago and we were playing against a really good team in the finals of a tournament and uh, the player who was returning in the ad court has a really big inside-out forehand. 
and he, he might even listen to this episode, um, but he he has a really big inside out for hand and he plays in the ad court. And my partner and I wanted to come up with a way to uh, to kind of take that away from him. We knew we want to avoid his inside out forehand. And he's a pretty mobile person, so we can't exactly just hit kick serves because he's able to run around it really well. And he's able to hit that run around inside out forehand uh, with a lot of power. It makes it really difficult uh, serving to the ad court. So what we did is we used uh, positioning and direction are the two kind of strategies that we used here. So uh, when we were serving in the ad court to him, we were able to play I formation and have the uh, the player at the net kind of stay to the left to take away that inside out forehand. And we were able to make a few adjustments on the serve as well. So we were able to, uh, from this I formation, hit down the tee with some spin, a little bit slower ball we noticed worked better. And he had a little bit more trouble hitting that inside in forehand. And probably the reason for this is because he plays so many doubles matches from that ad court. And I know this uh, this used to be the case for me until the past year when I started playing more singles, but uh, this player has probably played so many uh, doubles teams that just continue to use the traditional formation against him that he's so comfortable with that inside out forehand and he just doesn't have as many reps hitting the inside in uh, forehand. So we were able to use the eye formation serve down the tee. He still hit some great forehands, but you know it probably dropped that percentage uh, a little bit. Maybe it got us an extra two or three points uh, throughout the match, and every little bit helps. Um, these margins are going to be really small. So that's an example of an adjustment we made that, uh, that we felt like worked pretty well. Uh, we got broken only once throughout the match. Uh, we did lose in the third set 10-point tiebreaker. Um, but there were only two breaks in the match, and uh, we felt like that worked uh, uh, really well um, as far as positioning, uh, adjusting our, our pace, um, as well as our, our direction. So the next example is from a mixed doubles match several years ago. My partner and I were playing against two uh, younger players. I, th- I think they were maybe still in high school at the time. It was an open level match. And they were both going to play uh, D1 or D2 college or something like that. So if we had played them in singles, they would have really wiped us off the court um, because they were, you know, in those high school kids who are hitting all the time and hit so many balls a week and play every day. Uh, but what we noticed is that because they're playing at such a high level and they're playing uh, all these high school kids who uh, can hit the ball really well and they're about to go play college tennis, uh, these two uh, players had a lot of trouble with slow pace. So my partner uh, was hitting really kind of weak, short second serves that stayed low. And these kids kept just stepping in and trying to rip the ball uh, at the net player, which was me in a lot of cases. And all I'd have to do usually is just duck and they'd miss the ball out um, or it would clip the net and, and they'd miss it that way. So anytime we got into a rally, uh, any returns, I was able to kind of chip and hit a, take a little pace off it. Uh, we really found a lot of success with that because these, uh, these two players were so used to being out there on the court all day and hitting with a bunch of pace and hitting a really good, heavy, uh, deep ball that any sort of like short slice with no pace, they really struggled with. Now, if, if we had, you know, played our normal game and tried to, uh, Hit, hit the crap out of the ball, uh, we definitely would have lost this match. Um, it was a tight match. I think we won 7-5, 6-4, something like that. Uh, but we, we had to find out that they uh, didn't like um, any slow-paced balls uh, and, and had to kind of make that adjustment because that's not our normal game. But it, it's, you know, as with all strategy, it's, it's more important to make the other team uncomfortable than it is to kind of play your game unless you feel like for sure you're uh, you're the better team regardless. So uh, that's another example there of a uh, using pace in this case to make some adjustments. Uh, and then in the next example, I want to talk about uh, different player adjustments if we have a really weak player on the other side of the net. 
So the last match I want to talk about is a mixed match I played several years ago as well. And we were playing against a, uh, a an uneven pair. So I think it was a 4-5 guy and a 3-5 girl. So the 3-5 girl was uh, the weakest player on the court. And we were trying to attack her, you know, get, get every ball to her and just avoid this 4-5 guy. And one of the issues we had early on in the match was the, this 4-5 guy he was able to serve and volley. He would return and volley, and we just couldn't uh, couldn't get the ball by him. He he was real quick. Um, he was kind of all over the net. Uh, he had, he had a good serve. He had a good return. So it was difficult to kind of redirect the ball away from him. So what we used in this case is uh, height and depth. So he would serve and volley, and eventually my partner and I were able to uh, use height to get the ball over his head. We essentially lobbed him. Uh, and we would lob down the line or cross court depending on where he was. And that way we were able to uh, get it over his head and get it back to the weaker player uh, who was standing in the back of the court. Eventually, he made the adjustment of stepping back, which which was a good move. Um, but uh, if he had it his way and if we hadn't have made any adjustments, he would have kept attacking the net and we would have lost that match pretty quickly. But we were able to use depth and height and hit some uh, high. And in my case, I was using a lot of spin, so I would hit a high, heavy uh, top spin lob uh, deep in the court, and that worked really well uh, until he started playing back. Uh, and then we had to make some more adjustments there, which I won't get into. Uh, but that's a, a good example for you of when one player is a lot weaker on the court, using that depth and height to make some adjustments there. So one last thing before I go here, if you want more help with kind of creating an on-court strategy with your teammate, uh, if you want some help, you know, making those adjustments during changeovers or on a set break, go to thetennistribe.com slash playbook. And what I've got there is a one-page playbook that you can print off and fill out and bring it in your tennis bag with you on the doubles court. It's got a lot of different questions on there, a lot of things you can think about during your match, before your match, uh, as well as after your match, on uh, a lot of what we've talked about here today. It talks about, um, or it has questions about uh, the opponents, who's the weaker player, what's their weaker shot, uh, which return is weakest. Uh, I've got a little chart on, uh, the different returns that you should try to make them hit. Uh, it talks a little bit about formations, um, height, spin, direction, depth, all these things we've talked about today, um, as well as working with your partner. So uh, again, go to thetennistribe.com slash playbook and just enter your email uh, to sign up for the weekly doubles newsletter, and we will send you a free copy of the one-page on-court playbook that you can carry with you in your tennis bag. So thanks everyone for listening and I will talk to you next time. If you're a doubles player, you'll love our weekly doubles newsletter. Every Thursday, we send you doubles tips and strategies to help you improve your game and become a smarter player. When you sign up, you'll get a free 10-page guide on how to play with more confidence and dominate at the net in doubles. You can go to thetennistribe.com to sign up now.